Okay, um, kia ora koutou everybody, I'm Nadia Abu Shanab and I'm the former coordinator at a group called Auckland Action Against Poverty and some of you in this room actually belong to that group. Um, I'm still a member of the group, I'm no longer the coordinator. Um, but um, I want to start with the caveat that I'm by, by no means an academic and I would never claim to be and I'm by no means an expert on social movements, resistance and social change. But what I am is someone who is heavily interested and invested in the politics of social change and resistance. And as a Palestinian, um, I think, you know, I've grown up as an expert in the, on people's commentary on resistance movements because it's always been a response to me saying for 25 years that I'm a Palestinian people want to tell me their commentary on what they think about Palestinian resistance and struggle and that is just a reality of my life and I think also the other thing that was interesting about what Campbell was saying was he was discussing I mean we we're talking about that kind of idea of hopelessness or hope and I really I've always really liked um, and ascribed to the Gramsci maxim that Edward Said really liked and that was pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will I think for some people this stuff about social movements and resistance and change is something interesting it's something an interesting area to investigate academically but for other people it's a lived reality and um, for a lot of us it's really defined our lives and as a Palestinian I consider myself to be one of those people and the Gramsci ma maxim for me about pessimism of the intellect is that we can understand academically the context of all these things um, and we can be pessimistic about you know, powerful forces or tools of oppression. But at the end of the day, for some people, optimism is an imperative. We have to be hopeful about what's going to happen. And as Palestinians, optimism is an imperative. Now, obviously, today I'm not talking about the situation in Palestine, but I just wanted to contextualise with that. Um, and I'm pleased that over the next few days we'll have an opportunity to enter into a kind of collective discussion about how the acad academic community reflects, appraises and participates in movements, resistance and social change. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that I was really lucky to work in a role um, where I was actually paid to engage with this stuff in a practical sense. Um, I spent five years in a university context studying politics and education and um, I have to say that my learning around um, structural unemployment, inequality, poverty and those things um, has actually in the last six months working at AAAP um, outstripped what I learned in my degree and I th I'm, I'm being upfront about that. I don't want to devalue academic work but what I do want to say is and place a precedence upon is practical experience and practical knowledge of being an activist for me is, is something I really value. So um, I want to start by asking what an impact can look like and um, I'll, I'll sort of move on now to talking a little bit about who we are as Auckland Action Against Poverty. So um, AAAP are an anti-capitalist direct action research and education and advocacy group who were formed with the explicit intention of mobilising against the neoliberalism, neoliberal agenda on jobs, welfare and the poor. And we were set up in late 2010 with the purpose of doing everything possible to expose and oppose National's agenda on welfare as expressed through the recommendations of the government's welfare working group. And I just want to elaborate on that a little bit. Obviously, um, for us, such a mission statement requires that our interest in the question of how we here in Aotearoa can have a disruptive impact on persistent and grievous levels of social inequality is as much practical as it is theoretical. Okay, And I think it's also important to state that we're a political group that aims to extend or does extend beyond um, parliamentary debate and parliamentary parameters for what that debate should be. So I just want to make a, a little reference to, um, you know, we've wit like a lot of us mem members of AAAP have witnessed the way in which parliament and electoral politics define the parameters of, pub of, of public debate and actually terms of reference. Mm -hmm. So if we think about the most recent election, the term child poverty is consistently used over and over again. Um, and I think we, we've seen that through politicians, obviously that came through some groups who lobbied politicians to use that terminology, but we at AAAP, you know, we, we cannot, we're not limited by, that, by that, that language. We actually, we talk about poverty, mm -hmm. um, 
child poverty is actually adult poverty. It's poverty in entire communities and child poverty doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, so I want to say that and um, move on also, I guess, to my next slide because I'm contextualising the work that we do in our most recent political action and a piece of praxis which happened in um, South Auckland and I'm just going to show this brief video and you're going to see a lot of me and Sue talking today because there's actually me and Sue in this video and I do apologise but I thought this was a good video just to just to briefly show people a little bit about what we're doing, a little bit more exciting than me explaining it and hopefully it will play. We're here at Mangare Work and Income for the Auckland Action Against Poverty Impact. We've got 25 advocates from up and down New Zealand. They're going to be working with people to make sure they're getting their full entitlements from work and income. This morning uh, we had queues waiting when we arrived at quarter past eight. There are obviously many, many people out here in Mangari who um, want assistance. Um, the first person that I worked with this morning um, had no food in the house, hadn't had food in the house for days. She'd sent her daughter to school with no food. Um, th this is the situation when you have a welfare system as uncaring as ours. What the welfare reforms have meant over the last year has been that AAAP and other beneficiary groups have been very, very busy trying to help people with the impacts. Um, so many people are um, not being granted the benefit or are having their benefits cut when they shouldn't be or are on the wrong benefit. The whole drive of work and income these days is to try and keep people off the benefit or if they're on it, to keep it at as low a level as possible. Um, and for many, many people, they simply do not have anything like enough food to live on, enough to live on altogether from one week to the next. we found in the past that people are living in really terrible situations and they've got a lot going on, but when they go in with an advocate who understands what's happening for them and can work alongside them and knows what they're entitled to, that they're a lot more likely to get their full entitlements. The impact is happening for another two days. Anyone can come along and they can talk to an advocate and they can make sure they're getting what they need and what they're fully entitled to. Okay, so obviously um, when I'm using the term impact, I'm not just talking about it in a figurative sense. Uh, the term benefit impact has been coined by welfare rights activists here in Aotearoa to refer to an intensive three-day event where skilled benefit advocates and additional work and income staff are available to provide advocacy and address the immediate needs of low-income people. We actually do that advocacy on a daily basis or Auckland Action Against Poverty, but the impact is an opportunity to do that in an intensive context, okay? Um, so as the video illustrated, the political work of AAAP is not isolated to the picket lines or direct actions. Our advocacy for structural transformation is informed and validated by the systemic issues we identify in our direct action casework, but also our own lives. So most, of, most, if not all, of our beneficiary advocates are people who have been on a benefit or been unemployed themselves or are students living on a student allowance. So we know the reality of um, the system that, that we're working with and what we're facing. Um, okay, so the, just to explain a little bit more about what it was we were doing at... Um, Mangarei is to explain what direct action casework advocacy actually is and what it means to us and why we decided to, AAAP has decided to use that. Okay, so it's, it's a combination of legal work and disruptive action and it's what we call the actions we take when we work with people to challenge and overcome unjust treatment. Um, we focus specifically at Auckland Action Against Poverty on issues with work and income. There are a lot of issues that we could we could do advocacy around, but that's that's what we choose. And it's really important to remember as well that we aim to empower those we work with rather than simply provide a service. So we work with people, not clients. We never refer to the people we work with as clients. And for me, that was really important actually. When I first started working in the environment at AAAP, that acknowledgement of how important language is and how important it is and how much that informs our mindset as well, um, I think is a, is a really valuable point and I think it's a real privilege to have worked for an organisation that did treat people as people. Um, and because actually that, that's, a, that's a rarity right now. Um, and it's about making connections with people and providing support and building a community of people who are struggling against injustices. 
And what makes us different is that we're focused on fighting for political change and a re reversal of harmful government reform. But obviously, as we're saying, in furthering those political goals, we never want to compromise the interests of the people that we're working with. Um, I want to do a little bit of a reflection from the impact. I think the best thing that came out of it, and the most interesting thing, um, was on the first day of the impact, one of the people, there was a crowd, like a chaotic crowd of people. There was probably about hundreds of people outside, even on the first day, just desperately wanting that advocacy. And each and every single person had a horrifically jarring story of structural oppression, of being shut out at every turn throughout the education system, um, throughout um, the justice system and the welfare system. Um, and one of the women who had come in and she, she'd been advocated for, she turned to me and she goes, um, I, I want to help. I, I want to be an advocate. And I, and I said, okay, um, okay, well, you know, I was running around and we were all doing a million things. But I said, look, down the track, we're actually going to be running an advocacy training out in South Auckland. And I'll let you know about the date. And how about now you just help out with the cups of tea and you do that over there. And um, by the second day, she was actually an advocate. <laughs> and um, she came up to me and I said, oh, you're advocating. And she was like, yeah, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm just not a cup of tea kind of girl. Um, <laughs> And I was like, yeah, no, that's, that's perfectly, that's, that's great, that's great. And that was also, and that was the most powerful thing for us, that at the impact there were dozens upon dozens of people um, keen to become beneficiary impacts in, in the community in South Auckland. And that is exactly what the work, the aim of our work is. It's never been to keep this as a selective, you know, like a high skilled thing. This is something that anyone can do. Um, and it's been really amazing, even just the conversations outside that day after people had seen you, wow, like we could actually do this. We could do this here in our community. Um, we've, got the, we've got the skills, we've got the tools. A lot of the people we were working with, some of the people we were working with were born to be advocates. Others have been so pushed down that at this point they do need someone to sit alongside them, but that does not mean that, you know, people are not going to be capable of being advocates. I think it's always harder when it's your own battle. Um, so... I kind of want to move now and just contextualise that in some, theor in some theoretical stuff. And I, I'm a real fan of Freire, and um, I looked at him a lot when I was studying education. But I really like this this idea of you know that we the idea that we cannot expect positive results from an education or political action program which fails to respect the particular view of the world held by the people, and that such a program constitutes cultural invasion, good intentions notwithstanding. I'm kind of wondering. I want to throw this back out there. How do people interpret that? And can someone think of an example of a political action or educational act that, that we could say constitutes that kind of a cultural invasion? And has anyone seen that kind of stuff in political circles, in activist circles? Um, I think, from what I know, the history of rape crisis has been... Um, there's been schisms within rape crisis about which view to take on this. So there are the women who want to simply support the women uh, who've been victims of, of rape, and there are the women who want to politicise and raise consciousness about about the nature of rape. So I think there's been some some tensions within rape crisis over the years, and different groups at times have have broken away to pursue what they mm -hmm. perceive as being the appropriate response. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any thoughts about that? Well, often in the work of unions, yeah. the relationship between the union organisers and the people that they supposedly represent and the differences in their view, inevitable differences between the people they're representing and between them and organisers. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think I, I think um, over time, like I've definitely witnessed various different kinds of examples of this, even in, say, for example, in the Palestine movement here in Aotearoa, you know, we, we're often seeing certain people speak for Palestinians, you know, and this is something we talk about a lot in, in the academic community, you know, these ideas of representation and who's speaking for, are we speaking, are we alongside people or are we speaking for them? Are we the voice of people? That kind of stuff, I think is a really interesting question and I was preparing this presentation and I actually um, ended up watching this news item which I thought was really interesting. Um, it just kind of caught my attention, so I just want to play that. Welcome back. National's housing election offer won't impress one group of voters. They're from the Napier suburb of Marainui, where the poor and poor housing make headlines. Today, as Rachel Parkin reports, they called for change that was permanent, not loaned.
For Christine Poy and the 11 children she's raised in her Maranoi home, life's been tough and is getting tougher. The more they give you, the more they take away. She says this is one of Napier's forgotten streets. You haven't got the money to put back in your cupboards um, and you go and ask for help. Oh, that's the biggest mistake because they make you feel it. And she's not the only one. Kiramia Taito has been there, in fact, is still there. She's the driving force behind this meeting. People touched by poverty pleading with politicians for change at the grassroots. You don't need to be afraid to ask for help. Nearly 30 years after Napier was deemed a pilot city and a city not too big to learn about itself, Kitty Mia Taidoa says there's been a lot of talk, a lot of academia, but not enough action. So um, I, I really like that quote and I, and I don't necessarily think that um, she's referring to the kind of academia that this is here today, but I thought that was a really interesting point. There's been a lot of talk a lot of academia, but not enough action. And so I guess, you know, I, th I think it's fair to say that routinely in an academic context, the lived reality and experiences of poverty or any other kind of structural oppression that we're discussing may not actually be present. Um, and similarly, in analysis of social movements or change, there is not always a precedence placed on things that are happening immediately. And I think this is something that Campbell was kind of talking about as well. Um, so or there's not necessarily a will to act as part of solidifying or advancing fledgling movements for change that, that are happening around us. And again, that's something that I think Campbell was touching on. And I think the question that leads from this is how we can ensure in spaces just like this one today um, that we are not falling into that trap of committing a cultural invasion. Uh, so, okay, now, so, near the end. Um, so, a lot of you will know about the ideas of Frere and the ideas of the interface between reflection and action um, being praxis, but just to elaborate on that. So alongside the commitment to understanding people's reality, Frere also talked frequently about the relationship between action and, re and reflection, the sum of which many of you will know he describes as praxis. Herein lies an important point for emphasis. The interface between reflection and action both play an integral role in political change. Traditionally, the role of academia implicitly emphasises the value of reflection through theory, discussion and analysis of groups can or have previously forged social change. But the strategic action that we're doing today around Aotearoa actually relies upon this reflection. Of course it does. Um, however, as Freire maintains, reflection alone is not sufficient for promoting social change or any kind of change. In fact, it can promote an inertia and what he quite literally describes as a blah, blah, blah verbalism. <laughs> um, so the genuine question I, I want to pose as part of this workshop and uh, kind of what I want to end on is how can we meaningfully strengthen the interface between the reflection that happens in academic communities and the action that seeks political transformation? And I don't have the answers, so I'm not going to go into a question time now. I'm just going to hand over to other people and maybe we can have some of these kind of discussions over over the course of the next few days and I hope I hope that we can. So thank you everyone. Mm -hmm.